All right, and versus for this month, uh, I wanted to talk about these two movies because we had talked about um, heist movies at the very beginning with the Italian job movies, and yeah, going with the remake theme, the idea did come up uh, to do the original Lady Killers with the Coen Brothers version, but when that did come up, it, I found kind of an opening where it's like, well, I've kind of always wanted to go into the Lavender Hill mob a little bit because I feel like it's kind of as beloved as it is in the circles that know it, um, it feels like very off the radar otherwise. Um, and how these Ealing comedies go together, so like it just it just makes perfect sense um, that they're coming from the same place and um, Alec Guinness is at the center of both of them. Um, so that's what I wanted to do. And speaking of when we did the Italian job video, um, what I also really love about both of these movies is the fact that when we talked about the Italian job, we talked about um, how there's two different kinds of heist movies. There's the heist movie that's about the job, and there's the heist movie that's about the aftermath of the job. And both of these movies cover both. Like, there's one half is the preparation of the job, and then the job itself, and then the other half is the aftermath of it. And, um, and like I said, the, the aftermath portion is something that I always really love, and it's something that I would love to see, you know, more of as far as when they go that direction in the heist movies. But um, here... We have um, The Ladder Hill Mob is by Charles Crichton, who obviously would go on to do, uh, probably be most well known for doing A Fish Called Wanda really late in his career. Um, and then over here with uh, The Lady Killers with um, Alexander McKendrick, I think his name is, um, who I, I, I can't remember if I've seen any other of his movies off the top of my head, because um, all this is kind of last minute. But um, to talk about these two and what they pulled off here as far as being these hysterical comedies, but also very effective heist movies. Like, typically, when a comedy is trying to do a, a specific kind of plot or a specific kind of genre, um, it, sometimes they can be kind of hard to find that balance. Um, but that's when you're not dealing with filmmakers that know exactly what they're doing, in which case uh, both of these do. So, um, and um, obviously, Diamond Home Mom ended up winning um, a screenplay Oscar with The Lady Coast being nominated for one, as well as Guinness getting nominated for Actor for the Lavender Mob also. But um, the way they start off is a little different because with the Lavender Hill Mob, we are under the impression we're seeing the aftermath of everything, like all the events of the movie, where Alec Guinness's character is here and he's like sort of living the life. Audrey Hepburn stops by <laughs> uh, to greet him before Roman Holiday even happened. Um, and we, we're under the impression that we now know what happened because he has reached this point. Um, and so now he's relaying the story to somebody else, and that and I love the fact that that sets up what we think we know what the outcome will be, but then then again maybe we don't. Um, and as far as the Lady Colors goes, the way it sets up right away um, our obstacle because there's always going to be obstacles naturally. And here we have this very uh, sweet old lady played by Katie Johnson, and she's just going around town, basically minding her own business, but also totally not minding her own business, where it's like she's always bringing in other people's affairs because what else is she going to do at the end of she that? All she has is herself and her parrots. Um, so she goes in with this story about her neighbor seeing a spaceship um, and it, or, uh, that her neighbor thought she saw, and this is setting up um, what is essentially the payoff of the movie. And it's like the idea that both of them open um, with what's eventually going to end with final punchlines is something that you kind of don't really see coming, um, which is really beautiful about them. Um, especially for these stories where, like, heist movies really only have one or two outcomes. Um, either they get away or they don't. Or every now and then we'll find middle ground, like the original Italian job. Um, and so... Given the given you the idea that you might know where this is going, um, but both of these have quite a few wrenches in the plans, and that's where a lot of the really big comedy comes in. So, um, what I really love about the Guinness character in the Lavender Hill Mob is the way that we see like his precision and how that's going to come down to seeing his character change throughout it, but ultimately is fueled by the same things. Where we have that precision, where he like has you know, the, the small speck that he sees on his shoe that he puts back, and how that scene being repeated, like, frame by frame practically, um, we see him have, like, this epiphany moment, and then we see, like, that hunger coming to him when he realizes what he can do, and, and eventually realizes what he's capable of, um, and it's kind of this turning point for this character forever, and where we kind of see the mild-mannered side of him battling the sort of 
you know, greedy and money hungry side of him when he realizes what he can do and how he can sort of make amends for what he's been like his whole life up to this point. Like he's getting what he thinks he's owed. Um, and then we can kind of see the character shift there, but the sort of timid, mild manner portion will always come back out at probably the most inopportune time. Um, particularly when he meets uh, the Stanley Holloway character, um, wh whose name escapes me now. But <laughs> um, when we go over to uh, the Lady Killers and we see how the things come together, uh, where the setup is Alec Guinness coming to this house and essentially using it as a cover um, for this job that's going to go down. And the way they portray him as this shadowy, sinister figure, where he's like, the way they introduce him is like Peter Laurie and M or something, um, which he does very effectively, especially when we reveal him at the door. And it's like his his face has like this really twisted look to it. His teeth are like really fucked up. And he's like barely recognizable. Like it's, he's much more recognizable from the side. Um, but when you see him from the front, it's like you, you can barely see him in there. Um, and it's almost like there's there, there's so much like the twisted face to where it's like it's it, you could say that it's crooked because he's a criminal um, and then it also kind of goes with the uh, running joke that the house is like literally lopsided um, and that whole thing and how that's that that's almost kind of telling to the whole events of the movie that that's what the setting is um, and then talking about him coming together with his crew um, quite a few of which are recognizable, particularly, um, Peter Sellers and Herbert Long, almost a decade before their first, uh, Pink Panther collaboration. Um, and we see all the different characters where we have, um, the, obviously the, the big burly guy that's not all there, uh, Herbert Long is kind of the almost loose cannon type, the one that's gonna, that would be the first one to start offing people. Um, there's the Major that seems more intact than he is, I guess you could say. Um, and Sellers, who's just kind of, who's in the kind of the very early stages of his career here, where you can kind of start to see, um, the slapstick that he would find that was almost like his calling, uh, as it goes on. And, and all, the, all that back and forth, and it's like the way they're inter they're basically introduced, um, they're like, how their characters react in a situation are introduced through slapstick, and that's kind of... The great thing about the way it utilizes its comedy and its type of comedy, where like slapstick can typically see, especially nowadays, slapstick can be seen as like very sort of lowbrow. Um, but there really was a very classic and almost sophisticated way to do uh, slapstick, especially uh, back in this era in the 50s, and, and with people that were, that, like I said, really knew how to construct it and were able to find reasons with which to do it, where it's like, not does it only just sort of show the dynamic of the characters, but the way it's, like, how you have the scene when they're trying to catch the bird, and then he stands on the chair, and then he goes through the chair, and then somehow they end up on the roof, and it's like, it's not just the slapstick itself, it's not just the characters are falling over and things are collapsing or whatever, but it's like, it's the escalation of it um, that shows just how out of control and how out of, out of the character's control the whole thing is getting. And I said, it's really just kind of this, it's almost like a bad omen <laughs> um, to how this is going to go. And on that, um, there's also the mousetrap scene in the Lavender Hill Mob that I really, really love and is kind of brilliant because you have the moment here where they're trying to figure out how they're going to get a crew together and they come to the conclusion of trapping a couple of criminals, like like using bait and then doing that whole thing. But it's like, it's, it's like they're so blinded by greed to see that... Um, the, the mousetrap is also seems like kind of a bad omen, especially when you look at it, um, to where it's like it's it's not so much a sign of how they can get more people in their crew, but a sign of the only possible outcome this can have. <laughs> um, like I said, they're so blinded by everything, and and what I really like, especially about the whole uh, blindness aspect, is not only not only does it seem contagious, <laughs> um, because there is the moment where they convene with the criminals. And there's that oblivious cop that's, like, hanging around, and he's coming, and all the criminals are here, and they're planning this big thing right here in this very moment. And the cop comes in and is basically saying, like, you know, you might want to keep safe by shutting this window. Um, and, it's, and, and I love also the whole thing of how, like I said, you already get the sense that things are out of control because they weren't quite sure how many criminals they were going to end up luring. And the fact that when the cop shows up, Guinness's first response is, oh, surely that's not another <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, so you get the sense that they know exactly what they're doing, but they also kind of don't. And that's a lot of what you can see in the Lady Killers also, where it's, um, 
this heist that they pull off um, with Mrs. Wilberforce being the uh, sort of an unwilling participant in this, um, but even being an unwilling participant, she's still this constant obstacle um, where, like, even mid-heist, and, and that's the thing also where escalation kind of comes into it a little bit, but it's like, when you look at this heist, it's it's very slick. Like, regardless of anything, it's a very slick heist, but at the same time, it feels more complicated than it is, and I feel like that's this really great way to show that, like, it's because it seems more complicated the way it is, the way that they pull it off and having to go around the obstacles, um, that it makes them seem smarter than they ultimately prove themselves to be. And I feel like that's a really telling sign of where this eventually goes for them. And yeah, talking about um, the job here also, and where like I said, it's, it's kind of much more about the aftermath, but um, when we get this moment after all the criminals convened and we kind of see, like, we, like we, see, we see the moment I was talking about where he gets the plan and he realizes what he can do and how he can get himself into a better situation. Um, but then there's especially the moment when, like, somebody calls him boss for the first time and we can kind of really see the mild, man the mild mannered person, like, pleased to find himself in the position of boss uh, and how much this is also going to kind of push the greed a little bit. Um, and then, yes, we get another perfect moment of slapstick here, where it's like, once the job has been pulled off, now it's the, uh, the getaway requires a little bit where he's tied up and he has to dirty himself, and he ends up in water, and it's like, this is the, this is the way you do somebody falling into water, um, that's also, that's very funny while also being very clever, because an event after an event after an event led to ultimately, yes, of course, this is what happened. Um, especially at, by this point when we see how they know what they're doing, but they're also not com they're, they're not as competent as they appear to be or as they probably think they are. Um, especially when we get this situational moment when the cops essentially save him from himself <laughs> um, and Holloway and the gang see this from a distance and assume he's been arrested. And it's like, and then the way the misunderstandings kind of have this bit of a domino effect, but ultimately everything comes around and everything gets figured out and everything's great. Um, and like we see in the Lady Killers, um, they eventually get the money and everything, after, despite all the obstacles, the, uh, the objective has been achieved. Um, now the whole part is getting away with it the rest of the way. Um, and with the Lady Killers, we have, you know, like I said, the constant obstacles where it's uh, just when you think we're done with one problem, another is going to come up with Mrs. Wilberforce herself kind of being the whole underlying factor of every problem here, um, completely unwittingly. And, um, and there's this perfect moment when a gathering her, of her friends comes in, and it's like, we see everybody in this party. It's just this one shot that just kind of lingers for a while, and it's just them amongst these women completely sticking out, like completely looking out of place. Um, and I love uh, Guinness at the piano playing with like such contempt <laughs> um, for being stuck in this situation. And then eventually uh, we reach the point where they decide that she needs, she figures out too much. She figures out what's going on pretty much completely um, and then stands her ground and refuses to let anything else happen except going to the police. Um, and so the title comes into play and they decide they're going to kill her. And this is where I kind of had an unfortunate um, series of events in life because before I even knew this existed, I had already seen the Coen Brothers movie at the theater when it first came out, uh, which I loved. And I remember that it really took me by surprise watching the Coen Brothers version where the movie ended up. Um, where it's like they all have to try to kill her and then ultimately end up killing themselves in one way or another, whether it be each other or accidental suicide or whatever, um, in all these very com darkly comedic ways. And I, I do kind of wish I had gotten the surprise factor when I saw like the original movie of, oh my god, this is the direction that it's going. Um, and while these death scenes do play out differently, um, there's still just a, a whole kind of surreal quality of seeing the way all of this came together, and it's like, despite everything, despite all of this stuff, um, this is what it comes to, and it's like, and just kind of the whole instant karma kind of thing, um, and it's, and, and you get little comedic beats even in between, like, even after it's been clear that this can only end in death, we still get comedic moments, like, sellers waiting outside the door, and like, 
try, like imagining he's gonna go full western on this sleeping old woman with the gun um, in moments like that. And then, but interestingly enough, um, despite the comedic nature of these deaths and the sort of the sort of surprise factor that this is where it ends up. Um, or maybe not so surprised when you see, but like the the darkness of it is what's kind of surprising. Even though they do set that up with setting up Guinness as essentially a horror movie character in the shadows, um, still just the just the nature of this climax is so darkly hilarious um, that this is the outcome is beautiful. Um, but despite all that and despite how funny it is, it's actually a really well crafted climax. Um, where we have, like, the way the train smoke is utilized when it goes under them. Um, there's the way Guinness uses, like, his echoing voice. Like I said, he kind of becomes a horror movie character again, um, when it's down to just he and Herbert Lom. And then there's the moment when he, like, you know, like, pushes the ladder off. Uh, and it's, like, this whole sequence where he's, like, on the ladder and it's, um, basically this action sequence, um, in this very dark um, like, caper comedy, but somehow it, once again, like the escalation, while it's a great climax, and, a, and a, honestly a suspenseful one, there's always going to be that comedic nature to it, because once again, it's all about that escalation, where it's like, you think about the series of events that led us to this point, and it's all just been consistently getting out of control, um, and it's like, it's, I, I kind of love the irony of that too, the c consistently out of control, <laughs> um, where it's like, you can rely on this to happen, you can rely on this to be completely out of anyone's control whatsoever, um, until they're all dead, except for, um, the poor Mrs. Wilberforce who actually ends up with everything because of the very first scene setting up why this would happen, why it would be this outcome. Um, and it's just, and it's just so perfectly wrapped up, um, and, and it's beautiful. Um, as far as the, um, the last bit of The Labyrinth of Mob, which is probably easily the most famous, uh, bits about it, starting with, uh, we were talking, well, first off, I love the idea of once it's all over and he's deemed as, like, a hero, and we get these back and forth shots of him, like, you know, looking all sophisticated and helping the police, supposedly helping the police, in quotes, um, and then this is cut back and forth with him, like, maniacally, uh, making the Eiffel Tower statues, um, and it's, like, really seeing, like, his, what, what, what was once him is now a facade, and now we're seeing the real him that's, like, really money-hungry and greedy, um, and then, of course, we talked about all of this being so, like, it, it's this really elaborate setup, and they do this whole thing, and they get through all the obstacles, and they come out on the end, and it's like in the Lady Killers, it was Mrs. Wilberforce of all people, and ultimately themselves. Um, and in the Lavender Hill Mob, it's essentially two little girls, one in particular um, that does not want to give up an Eiffel Tower statue, um, which leads us to this. In this, this very absurd obstacle leads to this very exhilarating sort of double climax. Um, where first we get the Eiffel Tower scene, this very, this, the dizzying descent down the Eiffel Tower is probably the best use of the Eiffel Tower in a movie. Uh, and that's saying something because the Eiffel Tower is in a shitload of movies. Um, but it, it's definitely the most memorable, at least to me, I think. Um, especially the way it's shot and the way it, like, actually has that dizzying effect and then the way that it affects the characters in this very funny way. Um, but then, when that's not enough, um, we have this whole other chase sequence. Um, like I said, the, the final obstacle at the end of the day is just a little girl, but then the way that this balloons into something else entirely as well, um, where we do get to the point also when he, we have to get past the stamp guy, and it's like to think that another one of the obstacles there is them being held up by this worker that's basically as precise as Holland was when he was at his job at the start of the movie, and how it's almost like kind of come full circle in that sense, and it, like, shows you, like, what once was and then what is now, and the difference and how one is now in the way of the other, and it's this, it's, <laughs> it's like, it would only happen to this character is the beautiful thing about it, too. Um, and then, yeah, and then this final chase sequence, um, which is great, where, like I said, it, they make it an actual great chase sequence while also making sure it's still funny and still this sort of wacky comedy, um, while also being very clever about it. Um, and then ultimately leading us to the fact that the opening scene was, in fact, a bit of a ruse, um, and it was not quite the outcome that we thought that it was. Um, like I said, the way it's always able to come right back to the opening scene, um, is what's so great about these, and so, 
I guess, of being able to do something so over-the-top and sort of silly and slapsticky, but always having this clever underlying thing going on of these th all of these things happening for a reason, um, and t typically to the chagrin of the characters in it, um, which is the, really the funniest thing about it, because what's funnier than other people's misery, especially when they're trying to do something that they shouldn't be doing, um, it's just perfect. So, um, if I had to choose one of these, I feel like... Um, like I guess I've, I've gone back to the Coen Brothers Lady Killer so many times, uh, to the fact that I can probably quote it wall to wall at this point. Um, and so it's, it's kind of unfortunate, um, that, that this just kind of has that movie with it, whereas Love and Hill Mom sort of is able to stand on its own. Um, and I don't know if it's because of that, that I feel like I would go back to the Love and Hill Mob first, but, um, there's, I don't I think there's just still like this... Like, I guess the downbeats in The Lady Killers make it feel not quite as, like, fast-paced and, like, always moving forward like The Lavender Hill Mob is, um, to where I gravitate towards it also, but, yeah, but I was, I would say I prefer The Lavender Hill Mob, but it's by just a little bit, and I think a lot of it has to do with that last third especially, but also, again, it says this character where it's like this sort of down-on-their-luck person that kind of gets themselves in the situation, whereas he, he started off very sinister, but it's still very, very fun to see him play the overly sinister character that barely looks like him on The Lady Killers. It's all it's all very satisfying and worthwhile, so uh, I think that's where I stand on these. So um, I think after this, there's just a review video of Hocus Pocus 2 and Blonde, and then we're done with September, and then we're on to October, and all the horror stuff. Um, so I'll just leave this at that. So until the next thing, I think that's it.